talk about? Which one do you want to leave with? Godzilla. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. I agree. I literally just watched it again. <laughs> How can oh, you not love this movie? This is definitely one of the most watched movies ever because you can be doing anything never notice and that's the nerd cycle comic flick show we're going to start right there hey everybody welcome to the nerd cycle comic flick show i always like to start impromptu if you don't know why these guys are always sort of laughing when i start talking it's because i told them i'm just going to start the show whenever i feel like Our names it. are wrong oh i got everyone backwards no wonder they're laughing at me hold on i'll fix that i'm michael ah uh, no I'm i did Dinky it again Brown. no no no, no. <laughs> all right hold on Zoom. The Zoomer eats me. All right, so that's fixed up. So, welcome to the Nerd Cycle Comic Flick Show. He's Michael. He is Michael. <laughs> that's Michael D. Brown. <laughs> that's Michael and D.P. Brown. I'm S.C. Hitch, and welcome to this episode of the Nerd Cycle Comic Flick Show. This week, we are going to be talking about a couple really awesome uh, pieces of media. We're really excited about it. A very busy week, actually, uh, in really good uh, comic flick TV, which is what we have now since there's no movie theaters. Uh, thanks, COVID. Uh, DP Brown, before we jump into the fun part of this show, so we don't forget it, why don't you tell our listeners um, where they can find us? Nerdcyclopedia.com, people. Make sure that you are going on to our website. You will find all the links to all our social media platforms at Nerdcyclopedia. We are on Twitter. We are on Facebook. We are on Instagram. Make sure that while you're on there, you're leaving us some feedback on nerds at Nerdcyclopedia.com. If you're listening to us um, on you know audio, we... Um, I ask you to subscribe to your um, to our podcast on your favorite platforms such as iHeartRadio, Stitcher, um, Google Play, uh, Spotify, wherever you listen to Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, we are there. Make sure that you are also um, checking out our Carbonate Bounty BS um, uh, section uh, right on Facebook. You know, we love for you to listen to that podcast along with um, um, listen uh, or uh, giving us some mentions right on Facebook as well. You know, join our group. So yeah, you can um, carry the water for us. We would enjoy yeah, that, I think. Please do, please do. And if you're watching <laughs> it on right on YouTube, make sure that you are subscribing, hitting the notification button. So anytime that we're on, you know that we're on. All right, everybody. Hey, so we're gonna start the show off uh with a bang, and that's gonna be the Titan bang, bang. Clash of the Century, the 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 ultimate grudge match between Godzilla and uh, and King Kong. Everybody I have talked to about this movie has had really great things to say about it. Michael obviously was excited about this movie, excited to watch this movie. This was uh, his pick and a good pick. So really excellent choice for us to really dive into this. Um, because Michael picked it, I want to give him first, <laughs> first, first crack at the bat here. So Michael, tell us, what was you, what did you think well, I tell you what, let's start with a favorite thing. So what was your favorite thing about this movie? My favorite part about the movie, you Yeah, saying? your favorite thing about the movie. We have a clear indication of a winner of the fight. <laughs> Unlike, you know, other movies which have people fighting one another, you know, maybe for like a scene or five minutes of a movie or so. We have, we have many bouts, many rounds, so to speak, and we have a clear winner, I believe. Unanimous decision, TKO, third round, winner. And it is so. excellent to see a fight come down to a knockout. You never like to see it go to the cards. DP Brown, what's your favorite thing about this movie? Well, I thought one of the, the, the most interesting things about the movie was something I just predicted. Whenever you get two titans like this just come and clash for like three quarters of the movie, of course, towards the end, they're going to team up. To, to, to fight a bigger bad <laughs> mecha godzilla <laughs> or well, what, what, what is he called uh, michael <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, me mechazilla <laughs> mecha me 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 mechazilla <laughs> so I, i'm 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 not deep deep into the you know godzilla lore and everything so all i kept calling them was like grimlock the dinobot you know <laughs> um so i'm like okay we got grim we got you know a dinobot in this movie so that's like really fun to see but um, but yeah, I, I before this movie, I, I watched like um, you know, the first um Godzilla, the King Kong. I love actually that King Kong movie was pretty good. Um, and I watched the the last Godzilla movie, which was just okay and everything. So I was just trying to get like you know caught up in everything you know before this movie, as if it was like you know that much to catch up on. Um, they 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 had some really good stuff uh, with the um. Who is the monarch? Okay, Mon you know, with monarch and the outposts and stuff. So I was really, you know, caught up into that section. Um, 
And I mean, the fight in between the two, it, it was it was a spectacle. You know, what, what, what else you can really say? It was a spectacle. You know, if I had been in the theaters to watch it, it, it was just a good popcorn movie, you know, just to, right. you know, then, just to eat your exactly popcorn it's with. Made for. It's, it's not meant to have a storyline. Mm-hmm. You know, That's the humans true. are there just to bring along the story. But if somebody I mean, has to the, drive the, the King Kong to the fight, what we want to see. Someone's got to drive him to the fight, Michael. That's why. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, little little Mac has a has a trainer. You know, what I mean, <laughs> yeah, you really. gotta have the story go along. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, the, the 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 people. You know, I mean, they just move the story along. Let's just have the, you know, yeah. I w- it would have been nice if they had, uh, you know, a couple of the characters from the King Kong show up in the movie. But I understand that took place a while ago. Well, they'd be like 150 before. years old. They'd all yeah, be Mr. It, 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 exactly. Right. So, like any type of relatives or something connected besides just King Kong, I it j- just for me. But otherwise, I mean, um, the mm-hmm. the 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 I, I like the fact that you know King Kong put his, I mean, I'm sorry, Godzilla put his on, <laughs> put his foot up on King Kong and decided, okay, he wasn't gonna you know destroy him right there. They was just gonna team up. I was like, okay, it's a face turn is- for Godzilla, which is yeah. really something I I didn't expect. You know, my favorite thing about this movie start it was right at the beginning, and it was. When they when they revealed another layer to this movie, which is that uh, King Kong is living in a very a Truman Truman Show esque sort of enclosure where he is is trapped <laughs> there and he is tired of of humanity's shit. He just <laughs> hucks this tree at the at the wall and explodes it, and then just turns around. And he's like, ah, whatever. You can't do yeah, nothing to me. This I love bores it. me. <laughs> I love it. You know, you're right. This movie, like, if it were just the people parts of this movie, this would be maybe maybe a zero stars. And I did like how they committed to making Eric from from True Blood a nerd. Like, way to go there. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you, that's great casting right there. If you can get if you can get Eric Northman to seem like a like a oh, real yeah. geek. And I love how they abandoned that literally within one minute. It's like they were like, you know, <laughs> this is like not gonna work. So we're just gonna make him a stud anyway. And then that girl calls him a coward, and I was like, this is just hilarious BS. He's just standing there, like, you know what I mean? If, God, right. if, if King Kong was yelling at me and I reacted like he did, I wouldn't be like, yeah, I was cowardly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, would, I would be, I would be scared too of a seven story, go, uh, you know, gorilla too. You know, what I mean, <laughs> I'd be scared of a seven story anything had its attention on me. I'd be terrified. That's like, it's awful. It'd feel, you'd be like being a real life GI Joe. Uh, I mean, it's it's just amazing how you know the young one just kept you know Kong's attention and stuff. I mean, she was pretty much like the ace in the hole, you know, throughout the movie for him. Um, you know, she controls his, or she was able to speak with him which was a really good way of like, you know, communication, you know, to get that communication going between the characters. So I, I did like that. Um. I, I loved, I loved the, the, uh, the Millie Bobby Brown parts that were all connected to the dad really? from Friday night lights. Uh, yeah. Somehow like they were all like connected to that. And, and an insane podcaster, which I mean, f- seemed, seemed, I saw, I felt very seen by this movie. Right. When they were like, that, I, I that podcast rots your explain. brain. I love how they had to explain Godzilla's feeling like, Oh, Godzilla only attacks because of this reason. That's it. That has if you're to be at it. home and you start thinking about <laughs> whooping on Godzilla's ass. He's gonna show up at your house, knock on the door, and whoop your ass. That's how it is. Yeah. Because I know Mike, you ain't building anything to beat me. <laughs> because because Michael, I got sort of jarred because the last movie Godzilla saved everybody. You know, he teamed up with all the the the, the other um you know the monsters and stuff. And, you know, he was like the, the king of the monsters. That's the re- what the movie was called. He was the king of the monsters. You know, all the humans loved him because he defeated the, um you know, the other monster. He was cool. Then all of a sudden, right from the start, Godzilla is a bad guy. <laughs> you like, know, wow, Godzilla he, hates Florida for some reason. He's yeah, just like, oh, no, everything like, has been oh, terrible what, for twenty what, years because of you. What, what the hell me. happened? Where he just he just all of a sudden and they needed to bring Kong in to um you know to fight this creature. I'm like, wow, the Godzilla just made a turn. I mean, that was interesting. And then you the realize, least. like, like when when he shoots his laser beam through the entire Earth, you sort of realize <laughs> at that point that this really this fight really could have ended whenever Godzilla felt like it. It's really <laughs> right. What, what right. was going to happen next? And you realize Kong has the weapon, his ancestor's axe, which, okay. And <laughs> he, he, he didn't get that to like three quarters of the movie. Well, though. You know, I'm just sitting there like, what is it? I'm like, okay, I, I believe, you know, that, that, that King Kong is, is intelligent, right? The King Kong, I believe that, that these Titans have sentience, right? They've convinced me of that. At the same time, this is like, it's an ax that would have to be like 80 feet long. This thing is enormous, right? It has to be enormous. Yeah. yeah. 
and and I'll tell you, it, it's 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 definitely interesting to watch him swing that thing around like a like a big Paul Bunyan, you know. I got you gotta love that stuff. Uh, my nephew, my nephew Kyrie loves this movie. This is his favorite movie of all time. He was telling me all about oh, wow. it, all about oh, King wow. Kong, all about doing he's doing the, the chest pound and everything. And um, and, see, I, and that's exactly why this movie was made. And exactly, it's a popcorn movie. Yep. Yeah, because you, you, you're sitting there waiting for. Hong Kong do not exist anymore. <laughs> it's going to happen and we know it, right? Hooray. <laughs> and hooray for that. Hooray for scurrying people fleeing from Titans, which we never should have woken up and we never should have played with science and we never should have done those things. So th- thank goodness for Godzilla to <laughs> show then, us. And, and this way. is the result of, you know, playing with fire, you know, you know, watching the world and, and to have to make the mecha, you know, Zilla, you know, <laughs> To, to just um just to be the ultimate bad guy at the end because of I I was happy that one guy got destroyed by his own creation so <laughs> well naturally <laughs> that's just this, a trope. This, this podcast that's, is gonna get us we're all just gonna be like oh and then the podcast will be like <laughs> destroying Hong Kong oh, oh that, that whole thing like it's like nope that's telepathic what yep telepathic I had a bunch of heads right if 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 the humans weren't there we would have never known. <laughs> we have oh, known that uh you know so yeah a couple boring parts but you know it's, it's, it's definitely the type of movie that you know everybody can watch and enjoy and, and that's all that's what it's for it, it it made it for me as soon as king kong punched godzilla in the face on that aircraft carrier i said to myself delivered <laughs> we can enjoy this movie i feel satisfied that's, all I need. <laughs> that's what i need to hear Right, oh, and, and that's a, uh, that's what the great thing is. Like they fought multiple times, you know. It just wasn't just one fight at the end and oh, let's team up, you know. There no, was a that's lot of how hype. some other movies may fail by mm-hmm. setting up too much things. Where you know, hey, let's just get right into it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You came for the, you know, you came for the show. It's called Godzilla versus Kong. You know, right. so you and don't come you for, and they, they, get, they gave you three rounds of it too. <laughs> and let's talk about some of these incredible shots we got. That one of um, that one tracking shot from inside the office, where where like they're fighting outside, and you can track the action, and then they slam into the building. So oh, just yeah, really yeah. excellent, excellent yeah. cinematography. I bought all the action as legit. It didn't seem hokey. It didn't seem like a guy in a rubber suit. Although Godzilla did, but I think that's on purpose. It's okay. I'm not complaining about that. <laughs> he looked at when he turned around and looked at Kong. He was almost like you and I are brothers now. And I remember I was thinking about the end of um, Fast and the Furious One. You know what I mean? Where uh, where Vin <laughs> Diesel is like, yeah, we're in a we're in a crew now. And then Paul Walker's like, no, Family. dude, I'm a cop. I'm a cop. I'm not in your crew. And then he's like, we're a family now. And then Paul Walker again is like, I work for the FBI. And Vin Diesel is like, I don't understand what you're saying, but we're together. We're family. It's all about family. <laughs> that's how I remember that movie. I'm sure that's what it's like. Family. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I mean, I, and, and, and what else is there to say except hollow earth theory being true, even though, even <laughs> though there is a tunnel from Florida to Hong Kong, the Earth is hollow. Those two things happen in the same movie, ladies and gentlemen. A tunnel that has to go through the middle of the Earth, and <laughs> and the center of the Earth is hollow. And, and you you can apparently get to the the center of the Earth from Antarctica. Like <laughs> so, this is the thing that none of us knew, and and this probably would have saved all of us a lot of trouble is if we knew the Earth had a butthole down there. We would have gone down there and looked at it way sooner. And a lot of problems, you know, you got to do diagnostics, get up in there. Uh, why was there sunlight in the center of the Earth? There's a storm. There's a storm in the center of the Earth. How does that happen? <laughs> and, like, they're jumping back and forth. The gravity's going to shift. It's going to be like they're stretching us into spaghetti, and then we get eaten by – and, like, I'm going to shut up, Eric. You know, you're, don't, have, don't tell us what it's like. We don't care. Right. We're, we're not here. You're here to make a face like this. When, when King Kong does something crazy. And then he does it. And he drinks yeah. the blood out of the head. Man. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I got to say, there's there's very few times in this world where you get something signed, sealed, and delivered as advertised. And if there was ever a movie that had its own goods, it is this movie. It is exactly yeah, it did, what it, it, did, it did. It did a great box office over the weekend and everything, like one of the biggest box, box offices since the whole pandemic started and everything. So a lot of people went to the theaters to actually watch this. So um, that's that's a good thing for, you know, theater, um, you know, moviegoers and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's a great movie for theaters. You know, I mean, it, it's perfect. You know, 
you get to see Kong and Godzilla fight on a you know an IMAX. You know, who wants yeah, to see that? If, if if you're inching to get out, you know, and do something, this is the movie to do it. You know, to to escape from it all, and just uh, you know have your mind just you know just just not not <laughs> have to think about anything. Just watching right, two right. you know just creatures just punch. And enjoy a movie. You know, don't be like hmm. The center of the earth is a theory. I should have. I should have <laughs> hey, how'd the sun get down here? And you're just like, shut up, shut up. Shut up. It's a movie. Shut up. You know, it's like <laughs> nobody cares. I love that they don't even try to explain it. Like that's and that's the thing. Like the stuff that's terrible that, that would be terrible if they were like trying to be like the sun reflects through that. And they're just like, you know what? Yeah, it ain't gonna be yeah, positive. That, that, that wouldn't right. work. Let's that it's wouldn't mysterious it, you know? let's, and it's also magic. To it. It's also they, magic. They just need the power from the center. Let's just get the power and let's just move on. Oh man. Gotta love that stuff. And um, I will say that the best part maybe of all the human parts is that the sound mix on HBO Max, on my like on my speaker system, I couldn't hear anything the people were saying because it was all bass. So they'd be like, you know, Eric Northman would be like, I'd hear, rum, 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 and then Godzilla would come on the screen. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm Godzilla. You Everybody know. sounded like Bane. Right. I'm going, to, I'm going to punch this Godzilla in the face. No, you're not. He's immortal. Right. Uh, Oh man, and I love how they have the the random evil corporation that isn't really that evil, but is evil <laughs> in the end. Yeah. It's like once I save uh, Hong Kong, and they have the guy with the accent that's in a lot of stuff now, right? He's like he's like the the new most interesting man in the world sort of character. Uh -huh. You, know you, I mean? you got to have the, the 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 bad accent, uh, you know, villain. I'm going yeah, to send my villain, evil daughter and, you know... to you, and she is going to talk some smack on King Kong, and that is uh, stupid. It's stupid to do. <laughs> <laughs> how about at the end of this movie and this is why this movie is a success for me because like it's not just all this all this popcorn because at the end of this movie my my wife literally looked at me and said this sentence to me it was like 12 or whatever she looked at me and she says i can't go to sleep yet they have me too emotionally invested in kong <laughs> wow wow so i mean it's kong's family you know it's a it's a, you know getting his home he needs his home yeah, it's family, right? No, we're not together. Family, we're together family. now. We ain't gonna fight no more. No, I'm gonna fight you again next time I see you. All right, I'm going back into the sea. Anyway. <laughs> so, 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 where do we go from here? Are we going to get two separate Kong? Uh, you know, two separate films again. One Kong, one Godzilla. Well, and then they're going to come back together again. This is going to be you know? more successful than the DC universe. Like you can already. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Isn't it already bad? is. Like, it took King Kong and Godzilla to do better than DC than Superman and Batman. Oh, How does man. that that's, happen? That's 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 the failure of a, a a corporation, you know, trying to control their who thinking they they know how to control their own IP. So do you realize, guys, though things are better. Do you realize that if this were 1993, there'd be a Godzilla rap and we'd all have to hear it, and it would be like <laughs> terrible. Yeah, and we'd have yeah. to hear it at nostalgia shows, and we're even when we're old, like it would be like, oh, oh man. go Ninja Gun. Yeah. So you know, thank goodness it's now. <laughs> and hey. You know, the other thing this movie is, is a proof of concept that movie theaters still have a little juice. And that's good because, you know, as people yeah. who consume this media and like this media, you know, any revenue stream we can make available to the creators we want to. And obviously, you know, we like the spectacle. I think if it were a different circumstance, all of us would have wanted to see this movie in the theater. And we all would have probably left with a very similar takeaway, right? We would have said, wow, that movie had some parts that, you know, I could have gone to the bathroom during. And then, you know, right. Godzilla punched you know, Godzilla got punched in the face by King Kong. So, hey, it's a it's a five stars. <laughs> right? It's all five stars. Right. Hey, there are I... moments where I can go down, get my popcorn, get a refill, you know, come <laughs> thank... back. Oh, I haven't missed anything. <laughs> thank, thank you, HBO Max, for putting it into our living rooms. We've been HBO Max heavy on this show, so that's great. You know, we've been really enjoying those offerings. And that's a really, it's a nice, it's a neat, like, um, innovation in media to see that delivery method be successful and the dual delivery method be successful. Cause I've always thought that if people could have the option, it would be really nice. And now with, you know, TVs getting bigger and such. Anyway, that's enough futurology for a uh, podcast about a, a movie where uh, uh, a, a enormous great ape punches a lizard in the face and we all go, yeah, you know, <laughs> we don't want to, we don't want to get too deep on this end of the show. And, and that's, and maybe this is a good point. Are you guys ready to, to talk about the other, the other end of the week? Um, yeah. Okay. So if we're at a point now, or we're going to switch gear. So it's your boy DP. Make sure that you guys are sticking around. At the end of this episode, we will be interviewing Marvin Wynn, the creator of the Edge Comics. 
the comic is currently on Comixology, so make sure that you guys are checking that out. And um, just stick around for the interview. We got some good stuff to talk about, you know, what he's doing and, you know, how he created the Edge and what the future of the Edge will be. So make sure you guys check it out. Stay tuned. So, all right, everybody, and make sure you check out uh, the Edge uh, Mars comic. It's really, really good. Uh, I've read a bunch of uh, issues of it. It's about a team of super soldiers who are exposed to a serum called the Edge. It gives them superpowers. So check it out. We're gonna uh, DP's gonna have an interview with him at the end of the show. So we're looking forward to that. But before we get there, we're gonna talk about this week's offering from the Marvel Universe, the most successful comic book cinematic universe by so so far. And and frankly, gentlemen, I have to say uh, that once again we were treated to a uh, just a really fabulous installment uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the return of Baron Zemo, uh, Zemo uh, and that guy's like a really interesting villain because he's, you know, uh, he's built by the Avengers in a way like a lot of Batman villains are built. And of course, the the return of the Wakandans, which is always so welcome. <laughs> you always love any time you get a look into Wakanda, gentlemen. Uh, this show has has done something that I thought, you know, I thought comic book movies and comic book shows weren't able to do what it's doing until maybe Watchmen came out, and it's maybe the the first real commentary on modern society like Watchmen that we've seen, and it's it's super super interesting and good. And we see this all this symbolism tied up in Captain America and the shield and who's going to carry it. Guys, before, well, we start off here, I want to ask you right now, with, with two episodes left, who is likely to end up with the shield at the end of this? Because I think we all agree who's not going to end up with the shield. And that's... The, the Falcon's going to end up with the shield. I mean, so, I, we, we, we've already seen clips like of the Falcon with the shield, but we haven't really seen the Falcon with the shield in the show. So, I mean, I haven't seen him throw it into yeah, a tree haven't. yet. Yeah. So, I mean, Buck, at some Buck, point, Buck. he's going to end up with it. <laughs> Bucky had a chance to touch the shield, you know, a couple episodes ago. But, yeah, Sam hasn't touched the shield as yet. So, yeah, you're right Bucky about that. Bucky doesn't feel worthy of the shield. Yeah. And look at what the consequences here. And this is something that I think, you know, it's illustrated. It's the type of thing, like, you, like, you know, you get offered a job where you work and you don't take it and someone you hate takes it and they're your boss now. You know what I mean? Like, that sort of thing is what's happened here. And it's so interesting because I think that that for, you know, for Sam, he's not, you know, he's not thinking that he should be taking Steve's place because nobody can be Steve Rogers. And that is, you know, we were talking about this uh, in our text chat. I was saying this, that Erskine's real genius was picking Steve and knowing that only someone like Steve could handle the super serum because he already knew what it was like to be the weakest person. Uh, you know, the sullying of the shield here at the end, I, I feel like we have to start here because it's the image, the striking image that's, you know, sort of ripped from the comics. It, this is an arc that's famous as, as, uh, as DP Brown was, you know, has told us, uh, summarize. What is your reaction DP to the image of the shield like covered in, 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 in gore? What is your initial reaction to that? So, so first of all, you're, you're thinking, okay, Steve would, this, this Steve would be so disappointed, just so disappointed that this has happened to a shield, you know, I mean, Captain America has been in many battles, you know, throughout his history and everything. And throughout the MCU, we, we've really never seen this, you know, it go to this level as far as, you know, what, what John Walker, U.S. agent is what I like to call him. <laughs> he doesn't deserve um, the title or the rank. He, he I will not salute him. No, um, he's not my Captain America. He's not um, my Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so John Walker, U.S. agent, you know, has, has done the dirty deed and killed a, um, not an innocent person, but a killed a, sort of, a, 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 a person that surrendered. So he's a flag smasher and has already surrendered um, and said that he didn't do the deed that John Walker mm. you know, that he thought he did. But John Walker proceeds to kill him anyway with the shield. Mm -hmm. The shield is a representation of something that has been just longstanding throughout, like, in this history of the universe, you know, this American history in the universe, the symbol of, like, you know, the truth, the justice, um, the American way as you have it within, you know, within this universe. And Cap, uh, Steve Rogers, you know, my cap <laughs> has represented this for so long 
to when um you know he handed off the shield to Sam for a reason in the end game because he felt that Sam was the best the best of him you know inside that person who was a, a, a capable enough of carrying up that transition he didn't give it to Bucky you know and it really was a re- and we're now seeing a reason why Sam um is 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 ultimately you know hopefully ends up getting the shield um um but may not you know i mean it's either two things that are going to happen with this either sam ends up with the shield or there's just going to be no captain america because as you alluded to hitch the things that they're carrying this show in the show uh are basically asking the questions is there a need for a captain america um should there be a captain america who gets to be a captain america why is there a captain america you know um Captain America back in the in the um in World War II days is not um the same carrying the same ideals and everything today. You know, that's why Steve had so much, you know, um was going up against so much with the government back in the Winter Soldier. Um, because we're 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 seeing a lot of that manifest right now. Is there a need for him in this in this modern world? Um, so for me, looking at that shield and seeing that blood right, you know, blood just striking, you know, on that shield was just a uh, a heartbreaking thing that I just thought Steve Rogers would just be so disappointed, you know, if he was, um, you know, seeing that today. So you pose up like uh, two questions about the shield then. So, I mean, the Falcon could still have the shield, but not be Captain America. You know I mean? He could still be the Falcon and just have the shield and, you know, just, and he doesn't have to represent, he doesn't have to wear the stars in blue, you know, the, he doesn't have to be Captain America to, to represent the shield. Well, why does Captain America have a shield? Why a shield instead of a sword? Why a shield instead of a hammer? Why why a shield instead of, you know, a magic box that shoots lasers? You know what I mean? Like, why why a shield? And the answer is because because he's a protector. Because he's there to protect people. He's not there to he's not showing up to hurt people. Really, I mean, the war is different. It's different. It's a war. The first movie's different because he has a guns and stuff. But they're shooting machine guns at everybody. Whatever. All right, different situation. But Captain America isn't coming. You know, he uses the shield to save people, right? And when, and when John Walker's being, being Captain America, when he's actually doing it, that's what he does use the shield for, right? And that's a that's an interesting dichotomy where he uses the shield to save Battlestar, right? When he falls off the back of the of the eighteen wheeler, and then he uses it to commit this murder in revenge, in in cold blooded revenge. Yeah, yeah, he goes right after you know the guy, um, flag smasher guy. I mean, and and and, and it is. You know, maybe we maybe it's the PTSD. I think you were saying this, uh, DP, about the PTSD that maybe he has, and, and how it's you know maybe there's a reason with so many combat veterans available, they didn't pick one in the nineteen in nineteen forty three. You know, there were plenty of those. Guys well, yeah, I mean, there. even in the comic books, he goes crazy in the comic books after his family was killed. So I mean, so I mean, he took the super serum, obviously, and you know, it's the super serum. It it makes bad people worse. You know, good people better. That's why Steve was chosen to do it. And now you got this guy who is suffering, you know, who's never seen anything on the negative side now is being called out and is, has to represent this person that, I mean, he's questioning himself on who he is and, you know, and he's supposed to be Captain America. You're supposed to listen to me. And all you got all these people not listening to him. You know, you got the Falcon yeah, and Winter Soldier who've right. been sidekicks Great this point. whole time, mm-hmm. you know, and now are, you know, and aren't listening to Captain America, who was always the leader before, so now he just. It. But that's it, yeah. right? That's it. And is that Steve has Steve was a leader. Steve had. Steve leadership. was a leader. He wasn't mm-hmm. just the the virtuoso violinist. He was a conductor. He could get the plan together. He could get people on board. He could get people to stay on task. And and Walker, for whatever reason, did not have that before he went psychotic. Now, I think that this story about him. This story in episode four about him taking this serum is so, is so excellently t- told, and it's told in such a manner that, you know, we get maybe three or four glancing shots, and you're like, he's gonna do it, he's gonna do it, he's gonna do it, and he bends that beam, and you're like, <gasps> and everybody says, and that guy says, oh shit, right? He goes, oh shit. Yeah, everybody yeah. realizes what's happened, and it's told so economically. They don't have to waste time with it. We understand exactly why he took it. We understand exactly what he's gonna do. And again, just like. Uh, Godzilla versus Kong, it delivers. The episode delivers the punch. And and, and man, w- if if uh, if Wand Division was an escape, was escape. This is this is the opposite of that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, 
I'm blown away with how different this series is from WandaVision. You know, a lot of people talking about, you know, um, Marvel, you know, the, the MCU, everything is the same. You know, it's just one story leading into the next and everything. So when are they going to change up tones and stuff? This show could not be much different. I mean, that this show cannot be um that different from um i mean any any what, what i want to say here yeah, any different, different. <laughs> from 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 one division and basically from a lot of other stuff you know um in the mcu and like you were talking about hitch before this has really been the first time they've broached deeper themes than just a lot of stuff black and white stuff on the surface mm -hmm. good and evil uh, you you got to clearly 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 define evil in thanos you got to clearly mm -hmm. define well, actually, with Thanos, you could actually ask a couple questions. <laughs> um, but but in um, other you villains, you such as... He's once to do it over a river of blood, DP. You can't do that. That's no good. <laughs> That's okay, not all right. right. All right. But how he goes about it. <laughs> yeah, you can't, hey, but, you can't do but that. But we ended up getting John, John, U.S. agent, you know, making him putting blood on the shield and everything. So to me, that's that's clearly defined and everything. But it sort of makes um, John a, um, a bit of a complex, sort of sympathetic character because we know that he is suffering from something you know mm -hmm. psd or you know um something from the war because he he mentions in, in more than just one episode what happened to them in, in afghanistan and you know him receiving like those three medal of honors and stuff something that no other you know soldier has been received you know received and you know he but but to him it's not a badge you know it's just something that we're constantly remind him of the worst days of his life which is what he told battlestar um so oh, he doesn't feel that he's worth. He he doesn't feel that um in his heart he doesn't feel that he's really worthy. This he's sort of um overachieving. You know they gave him the um the 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 shield. They gave him the uniform and everything. So he's performing um at a he's performing under a level of where he thinks it should be. Cap Steve Rogers, he's a natural leader. He wasn't even trying to be a leader. He was the one that jumped on the grenade. You know, he wasn't. He all, all, all he w went back in the um uh, the first Avenger. All he was trying to do was just save lives and stuff. When um when he thought that grenade was gonna go off, you know, he wasn't trying to you know, to show out in front of everybody. Um, Erskine, like you said, Hitch, he found a perfect person that was just a good person. You know, as as you was talking about, Michael, it makes a good person better. You know, it makes a bad person worse, which we, we saw with the Red Skull. And here's what we're seeing. It manifests itself in John Walker, just making him that much is enhancing his BSD. You know, so this guy actually just needs to be stopped. And let's right. think about him as a symbol. I, and, and I talk about symbolism in all these weird literary analysis terms, but this is a very postmodern show because the Marvel Universe has turned postmodern on us. It is pastiche. It has callbacks to other forms of media. We're talking about real world things and blending them with false reality or surrealism. These yeah. are all aspects of postmodern literature. And, you know, this symbolism of, of the difference between the, quote, greatest generation and this guy who probably is about 35-ish, roundish. He's in his 30s or something like that, right? We, 38, I don't know. He's... Right. Do you guys think get that idea like 35? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about that age. And who what has America been this guy's entire adult life? Well, we talk about weird stuff, you know, because I'm I think about history all the time. 9-11 happened at the midway point, And since then, America has been sort of like this guy fighting and fighting and taking damage and getting accolades. Right. And wanting to show out and wanting to say, listen, I am the same country as the greatest generation. I am Captain America. Right. Mm -hmm. I am the shield. But because of the things that our generation has been through, because the thing, well, the military, I should say the military people in our generation, what they have been through by being through the meat grinder for so long, it's changed them in ways that they don't, that maybe they're not anticipating. And it's, it's a statement about maybe us as a society and what we should be not maybe acting like we did in World War II. Maybe what we should be thinking about is what is America and why are we different than we were 80 years ago? Yeah, today you have um, it's 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 all about more like diversity nowadays. I mean, um, it's it's I think the show is really asking a question of what is America? You know, its deepest things. What is America now? Is um is 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 different for everyone else? It's not just one thing. I think uh, uh, the 
great question that the show is saying America is not just one thing. It, it's not just what happened in the 30s and the 40s. It's not what happened back then. It's what's happening now combined with everything else. You have to take an amalgam of the people living in this country and just put the whole, you know, mixed bowl and the mix, you know, mix, mix, mix pot and everything and say, this is America. It's not just the one thing. It's just not just a particular flag on a, 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 a make America great again or whatever. Um, it's, um, it's, it's not just what, 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 um, Steve, you know, represented as far as shield, but Steve was the greatest representation of what America could be because in the beginning, he did not seek to have the power. You know, he only he want he only wanted to fight bullies. You know, he only wanted to um to 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 um you know get into war. He could have did without like you know um the the whole super serum and everything. And another thing that the show is asking is asking um about supremacy. It's asking questions about um um people who want to get gain power to be better than other people, which is a really deep question. For the whole Marvel universe as a quite as a um, thing that I didn't even expect to even um, um, for even a series like this to even broach um, on that whole supremacy question, which Zemo was asking, which um, you know Sam was asking, um, and uh, um, um, Carly and everything. They they made her into a really great character. Yeah, what an excellent. Yeah, they're going to develop her some more too. You know, we're going to see a lot more of her and. What's great is, I mean, we didn't really talk about it. We didn't talk because we didn't talk about episode three yet. And episode yeah. three is when they, you know, Baron Zemo comes out of jail and his character, I, I find his character is outstanding. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I love the portrayal of this Baron Zemo. Yeah. Now, when he comes out, oh, I didn't know you were, you know, rich. I'm a Baron. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, and, and like, and him just dancing at the club. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they had the memes and, and, and everything on Twitter. Puts on with the that. mask and then mm -hmm. just goes, oh, as you yeah. can see, how powerful of a you know a soldier he is and how anti serum he is as well too. You know, like is he going to take it? No, he doesn't. He doesn't want these super soldiers out there. He so is. he's he has his own his own plot, his own plot too. You know, he, he does it by the violence as well too. You know, he kills the doctor. No more. You know, no more mm -hmm. super serum. Yeah. He's he's a Thanos in in this really because you know he has an agenda that he feels that you know is is um that is uh he sees a damage being you know put onto the world like Thanos right. you know with resources and stuff his reason in doing the stabbing getting half the people out was because you know he wanted um resources and stuff you know to better distribute um Zemo on the, on on the other hand he doesn't want soup the the super serum you know to be out there because it does damage to people and stuff he's sort of like a good guy in this sense instead of like the villain because he's really at the end of the day he didn't want Avengers because he's seen that okay is these 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 powerful people are better or you know think or they think that they're better and higher who makes them like a judge during the executioner which uh -huh. what's like the same thing that we we, we had in Watchmen? what mm -hmm. makes these people these super beings better and that that they're able to police us mm -hmm. they're able to control us and stuff and it's the same themes that we're carrying over from the winter you know captain america and the winter soldier are carrying him and we're still seeing this in zemo Zemo's yeah. so neat, and he's always been such. He's a guy that has like a pretty limited scope of the things he's gonna do, and he hurts people that he has to, but not unnecessarily, which makes him sort of a sympathetic villain. He's going for vengeance, and we kind of like get his deal, right? Like his deal makes sense. We killed his mm -hmm. family, okay. You know what I mean? Like that. This is a good beef to have because it's the type of beef you have to have, and you know, Spring and him, he's willing to help them. He works with them pretty much. He's pretty much spot on until like you know he tries to dip out at the end, <laughs> right? Yeah, like until well, then. Wakanda's well, showing. Which I mean, yeah, with pretty you know, Wakanda's trying to come out and kill him. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, <laughs> and in their defense, he is a regicide. <laughs> like the, hey, those he... limited targets did sort of include their head of state. So look, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. fair enough. That 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 country is going to be all about getting him back in jail. We can't blame him, and they seem to have the resources to make that happen if anybody does. So it'll probably <laughs> get done, and maybe it'll be funny, and we'll get to see it. And then, and then, of course, we get to see Sharon Carter again. I mean, and, and how great of a character has she developed before? Love, love you know her I mean? fight scene in episode three. Yeah. So, I mean, episode three was just such a great scene because you get to see Baron Zemo being put on the mask. And you get to see Sharon Carter. Now, 
Is Sharon Carter the power broker? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> she 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 gets to be a woman of action. You know, we get to question on whether she's a power broker. Her her character is way better than what I uh, remember her in like the Winter Soldier and Civil War. Yeah, I mean, she yeah, didn't she really was... have like a lot going on. Now she's like you know she's she's real you know got a lot of attitude. <laughs> I mean, right. I, I, I'm right. telling you, there's something up about. There's something weird that there. There's some weird retcon in that in that space that feels that I can feel coming, like a like a like a little twist, like oh, this isn't the Marvel universe you think it is, right? It's the other one, <laughs> and you know what I mean. Something like that that could happen where uh, that'll lead us into the next uh, the next series. You know, it's like you said, like you were saying uh, earlier about how this is very different than Wandavision, and it's very much yeah. its own its own tone. Its, own it's very much gritty. It has the it has that tone that the Captain America movies have, which makes them very grounded in reality. Right. Because yeah. Steve doesn't do things that are, quote, impossible. You can kind of imagine if you had, you know, an exoskeleton on, you can do a lot of the stuff Steve does. Uh, minus the shield. That's just trickery. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> not, that thing doesn't obey the laws of physics, to quote Spider-Man. Yeah, I was going to say, that doesn't obey the laws of physics at all. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say that at the end of that, in the end of this last episode, I miss Steve a lot. Yeah. I, I really love... I, I I just love Captain America's whole arc throughout like the whole MCU because he uh, the, the Rocket said it the best in Endgame. I mean, this guy is pretty good at, you know, this stuff when telling us, you know, doing the speeches and everything. You know, Rocket never met Steve, you know, but he was, you know, he he was ready to go to battle with him, you know. Right. That was really good. <laughs> that was really good. And Ant-Man's like, yeah, that was really good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, loves the Captain America, you know? Oh, oh fan, you know, you, big yeah, you, yeah, big, fan, big, fan, big, big fan. fan. So he, Ant-Man would be sorely disappointed in this so-called cap, you know. <laughs> So, uh, well, it's but on TV. I'm, I mean, this guy did this in front of so many people with cell phones. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah. like that's the thing about this that, yeah. that ending image is not what makes it postmodern is that it gives this is what's postmodern about the show. It gives us the image, and we are talking about it right now and reacting to it. And you can definitely imagine that in universe, those same images are rocketing around the world, and everybody's mm -hmm. having a reaction to them. And because you already felt it, you already know what it feels like for them because it's amplified by 100 percent, because half the people in the entire world are around because of that shield and the dude who carried it right 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 i'm right. imagining at the beginning of next episode we're, we're we're seeing like you know um like wanda looking at tv watching this <laughs> we're seeing like hawkeye looking at tv watching this we're seeing like um thor somewhere in the galaxy <laughs> you know we're, we're seeing we're seeing like images of like you know people in the various you know more universe you know looking at this just shaking their heads and seeing like wow so, look at this so now who's the bad guy now who's the world think is the bad guy and if it's not the flag smashers what does that say about their agenda and what does it say about the other the country's agenda you know what i mean what does it say about the switching of the sympathies here that's going to happen uh it's 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 got to be a monumental thing uh this symbol of not just america but of freedom who, and of hope who Who's government? Who in the government's bright eye, big bright idea was it to put this man into this uniform and to give him the shield? Probably I mean, did tough. they not? Did they not? You know, they they're giving Bucky therapy and everything. You know, he's got mandatory therapy and stuff. But they did not do like tests and stuff to see if John well, Walker. He did. He passed all the tests. Well, he, 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 pa he passed all the tests, but right. they missed something. Are there shape shifting <laughs> aliens around? Are there shape? Are there shape shifting aliens around? <laughs> Nope. Yes. Well, you know, yes, there are. Yes, there like are. A... We're getting a Secret Wars plot, so it could oh, be. Well, on yeah, purpose. yeah, yeah, yeah. We are. You're they, right. They you're were right. so, you know, the, the people right. were just oh, so man. in need of a symbol, you know, because you know they they need something to unite around. So they so, rushed them I mean, out. So they rushed them right. out. So what, okay, okay. I could, I could, I could get, with, I could get with that. Right. So, so you know, you have to rush this guy out, and you throw him out there. I mean, he's a decorated soldier. Yeah. You know, so he has all the accolades. He passed all the tests. You know, and like he has a great smile. Kurt Russell's his dad. You know, I mean, he's got all this great <laughs> hey, stuff. Hey, that's over. that's a you know requisite to prerequisite to be cap anyway. So so the government has this impression of what it's just amazing how how much Steve built the the symbol and the you know uniform and everything to shield up to to this grand level to where the government has this idea of what cap should be that they have all these tests that you should go through in order for a right. person to be cap. Which right, is they, all the wrong the test. Yeah. test. You know, they don't have yeah, the they, they, but they don't have the Erskine right. test. They don't have right. that but test. Remember, right. Like if, it, if it was Tommy Lee Jones, Tommy Lee Jones would have had somebody else be Captain America. 
Yes. You know? Great point, Michael. Yep. Great point. Yep. Great point. You that, Great point. That dude, that was kind of a dick, but wasn't that big. A yeah. Deal. He didn't want to see right. him die, but Tom, he was kind of Tommy, being like a. The, the Tommy Lee Jones character represents what the government that what the government now is looking right. for in the cap, which right. is this all is, the wrong thing. We, we want Captain America. We want Captain America to be our top soldier to send him out there. Yeah. Not some yeah. Some, some geek off the street, you know? Right. Gotta be right. Right. To know what <laughs> he gotta earn his keep. He gotta earn his keep. <laughs> great oh. point. Great point. Great point. Oh man, I love it. I love it's, it. It's so it's so interesting to see like this this multi generational story arc where you have like obviously Steve sees Sam as being the embodiment of what he is. And he gives him the shield because he knows that's how this is going to end. Like, you are going to have it. I'm going to give it to you because you're the only person who can wield this. And finding out, like, how he does it because he already said he's not going to take the serum. Right? You're going to take yeah. the serum? No. No hesitation, no. right? Zemo no says hesitation. No hesitation. Right. No hesitation. Which impresses him. He goes, nice. And look, this is this is the thing I say about, about Walker versus Sam, right? This is the thing. Is that Walker has this insecurity. And there's all these spears being thrust at him by women of color. And he doesn't like that because they beat him and they don't even have the serum. They don't even have it over him. He can't, doesn't have any excuse. They just right. whoop his ass they just real good. Butt. Right. Mm -hmm. And Bucky's Ultra. right. You should not. And they, like what Sam's right. You should not have tangled with him. Nope. Not a smart idea. Right. They have vibranium spears. They're much tougher than you. They beat him up. And what does he do? Like, what do they say? They say, uh, you know, you beat him with your fist. They'll come back with a gun. So yeah. now he's got the super soldier yeah. serum. Yeah. Man. He's, I... he's, he's so insecure that he felt that he needed this thing in order to take yeah. him over the edge and stuff. He needed it. So. Right. Because, like, yeah. like a baseball player on steroids. To these people. <laughs> like a certain yeah. slugger for the Giants that we all know and love. On steroids. <laughs> and he has a roid rage out. It's almost so. I mean, yeah. like, honestly, this this is. And it's and the fact that we keep stumbling on these, you know, these symbols, these these echoes that are are present in the story itself is indicative of good writing, good storytelling and yeah. quality to, and attention to detail. And that is something that is present in these shows. And it always shows out. They put the money on the screen. Disney does. They're making really excellent products. They should. I mean, and honestly with the star Wars stuff that's been coming out and going to come out, um, I think we should all be really excited about where the genre stuff that we love is going to be heading in the twenties. Well, I think that the, the good thing about what you're really seeing, especially with these longer form stories on TV, is you're seeing actually what's in the comic books. You know, on the movie screen, you're you're getting bits and pieces, but that's only could be told on a uh, on a macro scale with a two hour format. It actually, the MCU is a long format because the, the stories interact continuously and stuff. But I don't think DC has figured that out yet. Anyway, it's, it's turned um, into this this like Homeric <laughs> epic, right? It's the Iliad, yeah. it's the Odyssey, it's this, it's it's more than just these, you know, trite stories told to kids in, in eight color paperbacks. Yes. It's it's assumed a sort of adulthood that if you look at and if you look at the stories that were being told, it's not that they were childish, but they were simple. And if you look at how comics have developed over time, the history of the comics as the art medium, we start out with the golden age where there's black and white and it is captain america and it is there's evil and we have to fight it and there's something bad and we got to stop it right this is very much comic books in that era and as the silver era sort of got hold things got more complicated multiple realities more science fiction things developed and you know this is an outcropping of that this is a the stories that were told after those first ones the second bite at the apple the second generation the guys that grew up reading mm -hmm. comic books told stories that were more complicated and you know marvel is trusting us to come along for this journey without really holding our hand and that yeah, is that's, that's rewarding that's, in and of itself that, that's a that's a, that's a big reward think about endgame and what what happened in that movie it was a comic booky thing for thanos to snap his fingers and right. you know make the whole um half of the the universe population disappear but what was not expected was to the consequences and ramifications of what he did. I don't remember in um, in the comic books because I read like the um, uh, Infinity Gauntlet, which is what that story, you know, pretty much came from when he snapped like the universe. And then when everything snapped back together, um, it was really not a lot of consequence dealt with what happened with the people and the universe and stuff. This universe here is sort of like no choice but to really talk about 
you know, what happened as consequences. We've seen what would happen in, in WandaVision with Monica Rambo, um, and um when, when Wanda came back. Now we're seeing, you know, the the real world implications of what happened with Thanos. Think about that. The real world if you know grounded implications in this show are because of what happened with Thanos. And that's crazy. Right. Imagine just the stress on the food supply. <laughs> just that. Only that of the population doubling in one year in the middle of the year with no lead just oh tomorrow man. you need literally twice as many resources yeah. to run things it would literally destabilize everything and they're actually dealing with they're dealing with the consequences of that and it's that's, so that's 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 that the implications and the story possibilities are crazy to the point where you almost hope they don't go that deep into it because yeah. it's still a comic book universe at the end of the right. day. They don't need to go to like the leftovers where right. it's just like just hyper depressing all the time and no. stuff. But I'm glad they're actually touching on these themes instead of just keeping it straight comic book. Right. And I mean, that's what the whole flagship's about, you know, the flagshippers, you know, I mean, that's what, you know, they, there was there was enough resources for the people that were here, mm -hmm. and now we go ahead and double those people right back. And now resources are limited, yeah. countries are cut off yeah. again. Before right. everybody was united, America right. now everybody's assert... back, and it's returning back to a uh, yeah. The, the, you know, the, the, look at Captain of, America of the, and think about Captain ones. America in that context too. It's America saying, "Look, this one world stuff was nice. We're back." We're reasserting our dominance and we're doing it in a way that's more aggressive because we are using a person who is inherently more aggressive. Mm -hmm. So that's a more, it, again, a, a, not just a symbol for our America, but he is actually a symbol for uh, his for own world. Marvel America. Yeah, Marvel's America and everything. I, 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 I would love to see like a separate show just dealing with the blip, you know, how the world, they said the world, ifs, they, they, they mean, said the God. world came together. <laughs> You know, to 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 deal with like what's the that? aftermath. And what's everything. that Simpsons gift where Lionel Huss imagines those everyone holding hands and going in circles when all the lawyers are dead? And he goes, Ugh. <laughs> uh, you know, this is such a great. I'm so excited to see how this the finale of this rolls. And yeah. and honestly, like, there's just so. I'm sad to see the finale. <laughs> well, I'm not, but I'm not. And here's the thing: it's because on the back end of this show, which is excellent, we are getting the one of the three these three series this is the one i've been the most excited for because it's got tom hiddleston in it and he's awesome and everything loki loki's <laughs> gonna be excellent so like if you think about that was the epic trailer too that 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 latest latest trailer they came out oh with. it's so Very great good. oh yeah it's gonna be I'm, I'm excited for it i hope it doesn't stink i'm sure it won't like this like i'm now like no. not worried about it. i'm shutting yeah, up I mean, and like, i'm just holding my money like out Marvel, I don't care. you don't have to worry about that you don't have to like Oh man, I'm worried about this. No, no man, you sit back and enjoy the yeah, ride. Yeah, just just man. just enjoy the ride. Yeah, it's, it's a roller coaster that's just not ended anytime soon. You know. <laughs> so this is so if we have the if this is the Captain America thread, right? If this is if we figure there's a Thor thread, a Captain America thread, mm -hmm. and Iron Man thread, an Iron Man thread, Spider Man's mm -hmm. the Iron Man thread. This right. is the Captain America threat. Thor yep. threat is going to be Guardians of the Galaxy and that sort of cosmic right. stuff. And mm -hmm. there is another tent pole, and that's the Doctor Strange slash Wanda slash, you know, how is all this going to intersect stuff? And all of it is basically, <laughs> all of it's basically been a ten out of ten since maybe since Winter Soldier. It's been like six or seven years. Since yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you, you alluded in our on our, our, our text chat. I mean, ever since Winter Soldier came out, I mean, Marvel has been like on a um on a a, a, a roll. So we are going to leave it there. That's where we're going to end this week. And and we really, really enjoyed the stuff we watched this week. Michael, thank you so much for picking out Godzilla v. Kong. Um, next week, we're going to, I mean, I don't know. If, we'll, we'll get back to uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier when we're back here on the Nerd Psycho comic flick show. Uh, in the meantime, now we're going to kick it over to uh, our interview uh, with D.P. Brown and uh and marvin so uh if you stuck around for this stick around for that you're gonna really like it uh he's such an engaging guy we met at uh, steel city con in 2019 and we did an interview there uh he's you know really passionate about his stuff knows his stuff really well and i mean the world he's created is super interesting so i hope everybody checks it out anybody else last thoughts michael i'm looking forward to uh episode five and six you know coming up here pretty soon and uh yeah, just can't just can't wait for it. And then Mortal Kombat's coming out. Oh, so next time uh, is, is next uh, is next week Mortal Kombat next week. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah. When, so whenever that weeks, comes, yeah. In two weeks yeah. we'll be back. Mortal Kombat Mortal, if it's out, and, and then the two the final Mortal two Kombat episodes. Twenty third yep. Mortal Kombat. So we'll be okay. back in two weeks with that. So Mortal Kombat. We'll yell it right. Yep. Test your might.
Anyway, we just end the show. We'll see you guys later. <laughs> the cat's walking around here. I don't know how he got from uh, I don't know how he got from DP screen to Michael screen there. That was weird. All right. So we'll see you guys later. All right, that's the end of the show. Stay tuned for the interview coming up next. All right, what's up, people? This is your man DP from Nerdcyclopedia. And today I have my man Marvin Wynn. We met him a few years back at Ner at um, Steel City Con. Yeah. You know, at the um at the convention, you know, uh, he was doing his project with um Heroesburg, Heroesburg, yeah. um, and he has his comic called The Edge. So he was promoting it, you know, at the at the convention and everything. We met and you know looked through the book and it's some really good stuff in there, some really dynamic artwork, and um. So basically, we're talking today about, you know, the new release that just came out last month, March 24th, right? Yes. Yes. OK. All right. Um, so the edge is the, the premise is about um, a serum that gives powers. And while using these powers, you can come closer and burn out and um, die, you know, which is some uh, really unique concept. <laughs> Um, kind of sort of reminds me of like Spawn in, in a way, but um, right. this is as Spawn was wow, Spawn was actually came from hell with this. This is actually a serum that was put into people. Um, and I would imagine you would have like a lot of uh, superpower beings just like dying left and right as they use right. their powers, right? Right, Tell us so a little bit about it, right? So, what's happening is that uh, the character Revenant is the only one that's aware of this at the edge. Um, he was dosed with it um, personally, so they actually dosed him with it. Other people have been dosed uh, unbeknownst to them, so this could have happened. Um, flu shots, um, and, 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 and it, it's, it, and I want to just jump back a little bit. So it's a little weird that when I were in this, um, COVID thing and people were getting yeah. these shots and now yeah. I'm bringing this oh. up again. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's either going to give you anxiety or give you some sort of hope, you know, right. in a way, right. you know? <laughs> so, um, a lot of, all of them have been dosed, um, mm -hmm. unbeknownst to them. Um, but Revenant and there are a few select others. Um, and we're going to get into this in later stories where they're they have they're at the end of the life cycle of the edge and they're burnt they're burning out. The oh, wow. powers are out of control. Um, mm -hmm. They're being kept away from the public, but you can't you can't hide this thing forever. And eventually, the public is going to find out about it, and then it's going to be how is the public going to deal with these people with these abilities? Mm -hmm. But as you see in issue one, we've got a zealot uh, who's already aware and is going to try to eliminate them one at a time if he can. Oh wow, that's an awesome concept. Um, so what what how did how did you come up with the concept? Like how long have you been because I, I I know this is the this is the first issue that's being published with um or going through Diamond that was last yes. month, right? Correct. But yes. you've been on this for a while now. Yes. So tell us how so tell me how you um you you got started with Ed. Where did you get the idea from? So I think the idea came from I mean, just listening to people talk and like going over um conspiracy theories and things like that, like things like the Tuskegee experiments and, uh, yeah. and things from, from the past where yeah. where we're using the your public as guinea pigs for experiments. So it 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 can it comes down to a lot of the just like I said that the the population control and how you're going to try to stymie that and try to control how people are, are guiding their lives. And then you get to the point where you're giving them something that you don't even know what it's going to do. You have no idea what what the implications of the of this thing is, and and that's how we pretty much drive the story. Is that these people have no control over these powers. Um, even even the lead character Revenant, he's his powers are fluctuate just like everyone else's, where they could be in a fight and their powers just turn off on them. Or mm -hmm. uh, one of our characters, Randa, she has to continuously absorb new energy or her powers will just shut down completely and she doesn't even know if she can get them back if she doesn't keep charging herself so it's a lot of a lot of myth a lot of legend a lot of conspiracy and a lot of stuff like that that's, that's being thrown into this book and we're just mashing it all together and throwing it into the blender and see what's coming out i tell you i mean with the whole tuskegee experiment and everything that happened back in from like the um the the teens all the way up yeah. to like you know 72 and everything i mean you're really touching on some really deep stuff um yeah. i mean it's it's some um um some stuff that was touched on in like marvel comics with like the um i don't know if you're watching like 
uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Yeah, 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 Isaiah red, Bailey red, and everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, Red, White, and Truth. Just read that after, you know, reading and after watching that show and everything. I mean, it's a must read, you know, if you want to go out and read that. But you're touching on some really deep conspiracy, you know, type stuff. And it's mm -hmm. definitely relevant today because yes. of the 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 media um you know when you know when media attention you know happens and everything you know sometimes you can't trust what what the media is actually telling you right. so tell me how has the response been from like your readers you know when relating that type of you know concept and everything i mean the, the mistrust right the feedback has been pretty pretty good for for issue one i mean um and it's the first time that i'm sharing this and that mm -hmm. we we've, we've run through uh the first print run of issue one so now we're going to reprint. I mean, second prints on issue, on issue Ooh, one. Okay, that's awesome. Just just as issue two is coming out. So I mean, we've got mm -hmm. we, there's a lot of things in motion here, and people have been, have been like all the reviews and things have been very excellent with the book. They're really liking the the universe that's being built, mm -hmm. and how we're going to start digging backwards into a lot of these stories. And one of the things that I I like to, I do with the book is I don't do origins until it's important to the story. Okay. So we're not going to dig into that all the way until it, until it comes up in the story. Because the one thing that what usually happens with an origin is it mm -hmm. like stops the story in its tracks. Mm -hmm. It's like you're telling the story, and all of a sudden, we need to tell the origin of this character so people can can figure out where these things are, are happening, where they're coming from. And mm -hmm. we don't want to do that because we don't want to stop the story. So mm -hmm. unless the story calls for it, mm -hmm. and we want we get into a little bit of an origin in issue, at the beginning of issue, issue two. Mm -hmm. And then we don't touch on a, a little things until like issue six with, with Mystic, where we, we start to dig into his past and his mm -hmm. and those swords and where they come from. And I think we, we, get, we get a little hint on one page in the panel, mm -hmm. a bunch of other people with the, with the, with the sword. And we, we show something and I, I hope people catch it. But I mean, we're going to, we're going to really dig into it later. And then we're going to dig into Interim's um, past and how, She's opened all these, she's opening these portals that are open on both sides. Something else could come through. Oh, wow. Her portals are upsetting the, the, um, the time balance. So where she's from, it's 12 hours ahead of the rest of the world in time. Uh, so okay. you're walking along and all of a sudden it's daylight and, all, and now it's, it's, it's dark because she hasn't closed these portals that she's been opening since she was six years old. Oh, wow. Uh, and she can't close them now. So you're just, we're just building, 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 building. And we don't want to dig into the backstory until it's really important to what's happening in that in that one issue as we goes forward. So no lost flashbacks. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> well, right. but it, it has to lead to something. So we'll okay. we, we'll flash back to something, mm -hmm. but then it'll be picking up. So you'll you'll see an issue two. We do it in issue two where we're digging into uh, the character Bolt's past. And we automatically flash it right into the, what's going on in the story and how his mental state is mm -hmm. about what's what happened to him in the past and now what's happened to him currently. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I noticed that um that this is issue one that's that just came out, but yes. you've been publishing this for a while. So is this new material um that, that's been published, or is it reprinted material from what you what you've already had before? With issue Dynamics? one is brand new. So okay. we we had went back. Um, a while ago and redid issue one because we were planning to do a new trade paperback and we were going to include that in issue one and then okay. COVID. Uh, so back in March last year, we were setting up to actually release issue 10 mm -hmm. at New Dimension. We were going to do a release party and mm -hmm. I had this whole thing planned out. I mean, we were having food, which means people were coming. <laughs> I, had three, I had 300 RSVPs Ooh. and we were, we were, we were gamed up. I mean, we, okay. we, I mean, I was, I was thinking this was going to be a, a blast and, a, and this book was going to be a hit. Right. And then COVID happened yeah. and I got uh, John uh, Angle from doing the Mitch contact with me and says that we can't, we can't do this release. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I understand. Mm -hmm. And they still aren't doing like, a lot of in-store stuff yet. And I, I think that now that we've moved to vaccines and 75%, maybe that they'll pick up things in the store because they, were, they weren't even doing like, um, they could usually do uh, games, uh, tabletop uh -huh. games. Uh -huh. They haven't done that since last year. Oh, wow. So we were sitting there, we've got an issue number 10 mm -hmm. and our whole entire release plan is it blew up. So um, then um, what happened was um, this, the, this group, um, when Diamond uh, shut down, were, mm -hmm. were, weren't, weren't shooting out books. Marvel did. Pencils down. DC was doing something. Yeah. This group popped up on Facebook called Plant C. 
Okay. Where you had store owners just clamoring for books. Ah. So we were able to get up to, I think, issue five out to a few mm-hmm. stores. Mm-hmm. And then, um, I mean, it was it was working, but it was still wasn't enough because well, one thing that we were missing was reach. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I started talking with uh, Spike Jarrell from uh, Second Sight. He was telling me they were setting up a new publisher. They were going mm-hmm. to go through Diamond. And I was like, all right, let's do this. Let's just just go this path and, and see what happens. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's been it's been good. So open up that door with Diamond, open up our reach around the world. So like we've got books in the United States, we've got books in Sweden, we've got books in London and Australia and Africa. So it's been a big boom for us um, just being in Diamond to get that reach that we weren't able to get on our own. So you were self-publishing this. Were you self-publishing the first time and then you got on with Second Sight? Yes. Um, okay. Okay. All right. So that was yeah. the um, concept there. That's awesome. Right. Right. So, yeah. I mean, it was just, it was just circle the wagons a situation where, I mean, mm-hmm. we, we were aware of the dynamics of what, what was happening in the world and mm-hmm. not being able to reach those stores. Mm-hmm. So I would say that, um, when the, on the first run I did maybe 500 stores, I contacted. Okay. Um, a bunch of them got good, good feedback saying that, Oh yeah, we're we're interested. Send us a, an invoice. Uh, we'll pick up the book. So that worked well. A lot of stores were like, "Oh, um, I see you're not in Diamond. Once you're in Diamond, contact us back, and mm-hmm. and we'll 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 um we'll get the book." Right. And a lot of them didn't respond because I did say so. When I sent out the next email, once we were in Diamond, our contact ratio went up sixty percent. Okay. So we went from like a hundred stores up into like 800 stores. Okay. And then this next one with issue two, I've got a list of stores I'm contacting. So I'm contacting every store that speaks English and some that don't. <laughs> so okay. they've they got a website and there's some English on that website. I'm contacting the store. Right. So it's 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 different now in being in Diamond because a lot of the feedback I've gotten from people was that, oh yeah, I wouldn't have even noticed the book was there if you wouldn't have emailed me. Okay. And a lot of stores said, yeah, this looks really good. We're, we're getting this because our, and then other stores was like, people already contact us about this. So you're good. So okay. it's, 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 it's been a whirlwind of, of communicating with these stores by phone, by email, by however, <laughs> Pony Express, whatever, whatever I had to use okay. to get to these stores is, is what I was doing. So even though that you're on with Second Sighting, which is Second Sight, which is a you know really good you know for the distribution model, sounds like you're really doing still a lot of the work as far as like getting the book out there and getting it um you know known and everything versus mm-hmm. just just being the creator and, and the writer um as far as like you know the project and everything. How do you feel that duty split that splitting those duties between creating your product and also you know working? So um, this question comes up a lot, and I and I think that it's why a lot of people don't get past issue one is that I can create a book, mm-hmm. but promoting it is where where the sticking point is, and it's something that a lot of people misstep. Mm-hmm. So what I say is that I have to wear multiple hats. So I've got to wear the creator hat, I got to wear the promoter hat, I got to wear I got to wear the um, communication hat. Mm-hmm. So even though Second Sight helps with that i'm used to doing doing these things already because i was on it before where you have to do your legwork you have to you have to hustle with this stuff because you're pretty much listed in a telephone book and you're charging someone to find a a lega krasnowski in the phone book Mm -hmm. continuously every month Mm -hmm. and it's something that someone is going to miss they're not going to know they're going to be confused and like uh, well, it's an issue one, we'll give them a chance, but it's that second issue mm-hmm. that drives home the point because you can communicate to someone that you got a brand new number one. Number one is sold by the cover. Right. It's sold by, and then number two is sold by the interior art, the story that, that people want to continue with. And that's uh-huh. why we're, we're going to push forward on issue two, three, four, and as far as we can go to make sure that if we're contacting 1,500 stores, can we get to 2,000? Are there 3,000 stores or can we come in? contact i mean that a lot of stores fell during COVID, but there's new stores popping up now because i mean it's 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 a it's a it's a fun hobby for people to have but being able to push these books into these stores when you don't have marvel or dc logo on your cover right where you figure that somebody's going to order 20 copies of a batman or 30 copies of batman right and uh, will they give a chance on the on a new indie book right. sometimes yes sometimes no 
Um, so you have to do your due diligence to make sure that you that they know that, that book exists and that you're willing to hustle for it to get it out there. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So your scheduled um, next schedule is in July. Why is why why is it so long between um, <laughs> between months as far as like publishing? That that was that was on me. So when I signed up with Second Sight, they asked when we wanted to release uh, the books, and I mm -hmm. made the mistake of saying quarterly. <laughs> and I told the, I told the uh, trap uh, Bradley's the CEO of the company. I told him next time I say something dumb, just call me out because that was. <laughs> so after um, issue two, we're going bi monthly. So there okay. will be like so it should be September for issue three, and then uh, November for issue four, and then we're also possibly planning something that's going to be where it's going to be uh, twice a month. You go to book twice a month. Well, that actually goes into my next question about the whole creative process, because, um, I mean, I thought that you would have needed time to create and make the book and actually publish it in July. Yes. So with you potentially going bi-monthly, it sounds like you have a lot of um, material just ready and waiting to go. Yes, okay. we, we are right now in finishing up and I, I want to get it done this weekend. Issue 15 is where we're at. Oh, OK. Wow. So with issue 15, we we're doing got a lot of stuff in the can. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so like you said that before, we've been we've been in, in motion on this since 2012. So yeah. mm -hmm. we got We got a lot of books built up, uh, a okay. lot of a lot of a lot of things in the fire on that. And the, the, one of the good things is that this also gives us an opportunity to go back and make little slight tweaks to to the book um, uh -huh. if we want to like. Um, little coloring changes if we want to mm -hmm. uh, add a page here or there or mm -hmm. change up the lettering or add some sound effects, things like that, that mm -hmm. people may pick up on in earlier issues and say, oh, I wish they would have done this. And then we can say, okay, we'll do that. Okay. <laughs> so what we're, where we're at now is that issue 15, mm -hmm. and we're also doing two one shots. There's okay. a one, we want to do a one shot between each uh, story arc mm -hmm. that expands on something that we wanted to touch on, mm -hmm. but like in issue, between issue four and five, we're going to do a story called Adrenaline Rush. This mm -hmm. actually takes pay, place in Pittsburgh. Okay. So um, it's going to be where someone's got a vial of the edge, then they're, they're selling on the black market and it's attracting all these people into the city to try to get it. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they don't want to pay for it. So it's, it's going to be a, a rush. Like, a, like that's why I call it adrenaline, adrenaline Rush to get at this thing okay. before it falls into the wrong hands or possibly falls into the right hands. We don't know. Oh, wow. So, um, and then we're going one between issues nine and 10 called Angel Wings, where mm -hmm. this is going to touch on a, um, a former uh, army rescue uh, general mm -hmm. who finds out there are WMDs in Dubai. But the WMDs are people who, are, who have the edge and they're in the last, the last rows of it. So he's going to find or recruit his former paramilitary rescue team Mm -hmm. who are all wounded soldiers that have cybernetic parts that are owned mm -hmm. by the government. Mm -hmm. So first, before they even go on a mission, they got to get, they got to get that leash off of them. Mm -hmm. So while they're descending on Dubai, someone forms a strike team to go after them, which is going to feature uh, characters from the edge and other books that are going to come together to help or stop them from what they're trying to do. Okay. Awesome. 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 Hey, you sound like you got a, um, so a, a lot of stuff in there. So um, what's your biggest influence um, on, on your work? Uh, I would I'd say that, I mean, looking back, um, our biggest influence probably came from the formation of image and mm -hmm. how those guys took a, took a chance really on their names to form this studio. And a lot of the stuff they were doing then was a lot of that interconnected, long goal um the, the the path of going forward with a story and saying that you might have to go back and look at something that we did before because we're going to we're going to talk about it later it's very similar to the the way that um the mcu works okay where you're picking up on something that happened in civil war or in age of ultron in wandavision or mm -hmm. in uh, falcon and winter soldier you're mm -hmm. like oh man that makes that story even better because now you've you've connected those dots and you're like oh man i didn't i didn't realize that that's what, that's what was <laughs> going on there this is so good right right and you and you, and you want to try to bring that that kind of flavor into a comic where there isn't a lot of that going on now especially in your in your big two because they're too they're, they're on a lot of reboots right. so it's like okay we go 25 issues and now we need a new number one 
and then you go another 25 issues then you say oh we want to go back to legacy numbering so now it's issue 60 instead of issue one again right and it's not it's not really you don't you don't feel that connective tissue because everything's right. building up to um like a mega a mega event every every other every other month there's a mega event right which resets the whole entire thing again and that's the one thing we're not going to do we're not we're not looking to reset the universe we're looking to pack on things onto the universe as we go along and say that hey go back to that other issue when i put those symbols or something in that in that on that page and now mm-hmm. we're talking about it now mm-hmm. you're saying that wow i didn't i didn't realize that so now you got you got a yep. whole entire run of books mm-hmm. that are just building and building and escalating to something they're picking up on those easter eggs and they're just adding them yeah. so yeah that's that's pretty decent um all right so what do you I, so what do you think the hardest thing it is about doing things yourself so you're you're you know self-published and now you're mm-hmm. on with you know um um second sight what's the hardest thing about the whole process from creating to you know promoting and you know selling obviously is what yep. you're doing what's the hardest thing um that you think that you do um, because even though that you're publishing this book, you still, I'm still working a full-time job. So <laughs> it's, yeah, so it's, it's, it's that, it's the, balance. Yeah, it's, the balance, it's the balance of time. When you say that I need time to create, I need time on a Saturday or a Sunday to sit down and work on this and mm-hmm. then trying to decompress from the whole entire week of working the full-time job. So it's, it's that juggle where you're saying that, okay, it's six o'clock on a Monday, I need an hour to sit down and, and write the script or send an email to the artist and say that, well, this is what's happening next, or get new art to the colorist or the letterer, or communicating with the publisher saying that, okay, here's my list for our next diamond, or here's here's the books I need for this con. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's the daunting task of, you only have 24 hours in a day and I have to sleep. That's uh, you can preach to the choir right there and everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you know, before we start wrapping up here, let's briefly go over um, like your team here. So um, so let's just just talk about your team. So you yeah. got a sounds like you got a really great artist. Got some really nice covers. So mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about that and tell us the process as far as like putting your team together. If you know right. for these books. So uh, the artist we we formerly called him Mark V because nobody wanted to pronounce his last name. <laughs> but um, when the, when the first issue came out, it's it he did he had done some books in the past, and having him as Mark V is was kind of messing up his um, his links. So when you click on his name, you don't get all to see all the other things he's done. So we we start we, we're calling him Mark Louis, and I'm going to pronounce I'm going to try. It's Vukunchiat. So he's from the <laughs> Philippines, and I met him back I think it was 2011 on those the former digital web informing forums, okay. which I think are gone now. Um, so we connected right away and I messaged him and said, Hey, are you interested in working on the comic? And he said, Oh, yeah, send me the script. So I sent him the script and he fell in love with the script. Mm. And this has just been since, uh, 2011, 2012, we just been, been, been racking it up. Um, it, it comes situations where, um, in that time, I think we, I think I've had to ask him to change one thing on the book. And that was Blaine's hair. I hated, I hated the long hair on Blaine. We had to change it in issue one right away. <laughs> Okay. And when he came back with the anime little uh, Pope thing, I'm like, uh-huh. that's amazing. I just love it. And then <laughs> the funny thing about it is we're, we're actually going to go into how he keeps his hair like that. And it's, he doesn't use any hair gel. We're going, to, we're going to explain why his hair is always like that. Because some people ask, like, why is his hair like that? Like, we'll explain it. Because it's, it's just something we just wanted, like, as a, like a little Easter egg and something fun in the book to say that, yeah, this guy's uh-huh. hair is like this because of this. Okay. Um, so our colorist, um, um, Luis, and then our other colorist, Stephen uh, Lefesky. Uh, I met Luis on, I think, uh, DeviantArt. Okay. He does, um, he does, he usually works for IDW. He does Ghostbusters, Transformers, and a few other books. Ah, okay. And, and Stephen, I think I met him on Facebook. Okay. And then uh, James Reed has been our, been a letterer forever for the Edge, and I met him also on Digital Webbing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, those colors do pop in a lot of the yeah. um the artwork just reminds me of like animation. It's it's, yes. so it's like you know when you're looking at it, it looks like it's 
like it could be an animation form and everything. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, in, in the future, you got some potential cartoon <laughs> or, or animated series, you yeah. know, you know, in your, in your future right there. So I can totally see that. So right. that's, that's some pretty decent, um, you know, visuals and stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you got a, looks like you got a really good team together. Um, definitely, you know, your influences are there with like Wildcats, you said, and like the yes. X-Men and everything, mm -hmm. you know, as far as that, um, so what's one piece of advice would you give to someone trying to create their first graphic novel or, you know, comic book coming into this game at this point, especially during and post, -pan you know, pandemic? Right. So the, the first thing I'll say is that when I originally started working on this book it was back in the 90s and it was terrible. I just say that I, I, I'm, I'm uh, very honest about my inability to write a, a decent story back back then. Um, I mean, when you when something is influencing you, you don't want it to take over over you where you're kind of writing Wildcats, you're writing Stormwatch, you're writing X-Men. And I had to pull away for a while. And I took like marketing classes. I took um, creative writing classes to really remold myself into being that that creator that I want to be. And well, the advice I give to somebody is don't give up after you fail the first time because you're going to. Like there, there isn't anyone who the first thing they ever created or did was right. It's like, it's a, it's, it's a muscle, it's a memory, it's a reflex. Like when you first, like with a video game, when you first pop that game in, you're going to be terrible at it. I mean, there's <laughs> like, yep. like a street fighter, right, right, you're like yeah. I'm playing street fighter, I'm getting my butt kicked, uh -huh. but I just think that like in two or three weeks, I'm going to be good at this because I'm going to keep <laughs> trying, I'm going to keep practicing and I'm going to keep making that goal. When you walk into that arcade, and you sit down at the game, you're not going to be the best in the world as soon as you sit down. And right. do that. So my advice is to always stay the course. And it's always about you get knocked down. And how many times you get knocked down is how many times you get up. You keep getting up. You keep getting up. You keep trying. And you keep blending that stuff. Then you keep learning. You have to learn. You can't just sit in a, in a vacuum and, and not teach yourself or find out how other people are doing these things. Ask questions. You have to learn. That's a, every, everything is learning. There's, there's no one who knows anything up front. So how have you been, um, now that these conventions, or, you know, as an add-on, now that these conventions have been, you know, done and everything for, for mm -hmm. so long, what has been kept keeping you motivated, you know, throughout this pandemic process? Uh, I would say process, that other, but, you know, craziness. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say other creators, like you got, you pop on Facebook and you see all these guys just, just grinding through it and, and making and getting their book out there and, and they're doing in-store stuff. So we've done some stuff in-store. Um, I mean, it's, it hasn't been huge, but I'm hoping that once this, uh, this stuff is over with and we're, at, we're back at 75% capacity in Pittsburgh, we can start getting people into these stores and do signings and do and like parties and giveaways and things like that. So just, I just go on Facebook and Twitter and I get motivated by other people just grinding it out. Awesome, awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Marvin Wynn. Thanks, sir. Thanks for coming on to our NCFS show. And, um, you know, maybe we could get you on like some of our, um, you know, podcasts talking about like the different TV shows and stuff. We're talking about like Falcon and the Winter Soldier right now. We got our Star Wars stuff coming up. You yeah. know, I mean, would you mind guest starring with us? Oh, I love it. Love it. Awesome. 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 So um, we shall see you when we see you. This is the way, guys. Nerdcyclopedia.